to our annual Veterans Day commemoration. And I would like to thank all of our veterans who have fought for us and um, served our country. Um, this morning we have, in addition to our normal um, program, on the back if you will see, we have many people to thank for our banners as well as these wonderful flags that we have around the park. That's a new addition this year. So thank you all, and, and also to our uh, Brownie troops and Boy Scout troops for their help, and the Acton Royal Court. Thank you all. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Pastor Wayne Wilson for our invocation. Please join me in prayer. O oh, great and merciful Father, we thank you for this day of remembrance so that we don't forget the cost and sacrifice necessary to maintain liberty and the institutions our founders designed to preserve it. We've passed through a contentious election season and that there will be a peaceful transition of power reminds us how precious is our system of government and how worthy of defending is the American way of life. We thank you. Oh God, for the selfless devotion of those who are willing to risk things we cling to so tenaciously, our health, our safety, our very lives to protect our land of freedom. You know more than we do, Lord, how much we owe them. We forget sometimes, but you never do. So we appeal to you this morning on behalf of those who have given their youth, their strength, and often their bodies for our security and the good of others. We thank you for their courageous labors, their strong sense of duty to country, and their sacrificial love for their comrades in arms. We pray this morning for the veteran, especially those who must deal in an ongoing way with the experience of war, uphold the wounded and distressed and their loved ones. Be gracious to them and let them know of the gratitude of the people they have served so well. We pray for the thousands of American soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines still in harm's way, even at this hour, in war-torn lands. Be their shield in battle, and be merciful to them in their trials. You know, Lord, we've lost several of our best and brightest very recently in faraway places. Comfort and watch over their families. Protect all who wait at home. Ease the burden on marriages and parenting with absent warriors. We pray for all who are separated during the holiday season by the necessities of service. Grant understanding and peace and patience. For us today, Lord, open our hearts in appreciation and tender regard for all who have served and still serve our nation in such a sacrificial way. This I pray in the name of Christ my Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, um, the Blue Eagle Color Guard from Edwards Air Force Base will now present do the presentation of colors, so please stand and remain standing because the Boy Scout Troop 145 will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance.
Good morning. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. All in uniform. All in uniform, please salute. All others, please place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in singing the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting. You may be seated. Thank you, Barbara White, for leading us in the national anthem. And now, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Major John C. Bailey, Jr., <coughs> retired from the U.S. Army. Um, John is a Vietnam veteran with the 174th Division. He's a recipient of the Silver Star Distinguished Flying Cross Bronze Star with two oak clusters and air medal. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for the opportunity to come and speak. I guess I don't need that mic, so I'll use it for a hat rack. Um, the, uh, wanted to thank uh, Jackie Smith and uh, Steve for hosting me last night. I made sure I had good lodging and something to eat, so that was good. And a uh, little bit about me, but uh, before I do that, I wanted to, because it's not about me, it's about the veterans. Um, I'd like to uh, have, uh, in the following order, I guess everybody's standing, but I'd like to recognize the Marine Corps. So how many Marines we got out there? Hoorah! Hoorah? That's right, that's right. Hoorah is correct, okay? Right? And um, so, let's see, Army? Hoorah. It's Hoorah! 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 After the aviators drop them off, right? <laughs> so, um, the, uh, let's see, the Air Force? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. good. And let's see, 
Coast. Oh, yeah, the Navy. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. And uh, Coast Guard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. some Coast Guard guys, yeah. And we don't think about these other guys too much, but the Merchant Marines. You ever thought about those guys? Yeah. So. All right. Thank them for all their service, all you guys. I appreciate it. It's, it's part of, uh, I'm proud to be part of you. And uh, what I like to do now is uh, just tell you a little bit. I was born in uh, Sacramento, California at Mayther Air Force Base. My dad was an uh, Air Force guy, so I grew up as an Air Force brat. And he, uh, almost 17 years before he decided to pull the plug, uh, he was in security police in SAC, uh, Strategic Air Command. And uh, when I was growing up, I told him I wanted to be a pilot. He told me when I got old enough to be a pilot, he said uh, the airplanes would be flying themselves. Kind of crushed me for a little bit there. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, then uh, after uh, I got uh, out of high school, didn't know what I was going to do with myself, and uh, Got in some little bit of trouble, and so uh, the officer that was dealing with me found out that I was interested in the Army, so we made a deal. He says, I won't press any charges against you, son, if you go in the Army. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and uh, so I did, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. So um, I went uh, over to Vietnam, and uh, well, first I went to flight school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, and uh, well, Fort Walters, Texas, then Fort Rucker, Alabama, and then we went. And we knew we were going to Vietnam. There was no doubt in our military mind that that's where we were headed. And uh, started off with 400 guys in my class. They graduated one class every two weeks. And by the time we graduated, there were like 200 of us left. So they, we did this out pretty good. Um, got to be, uh, Vietnam, and I was with the AmeriCal Division, and I was with the 174th Aviation Company, 14th Combat Aviation Battalion, when we were in the what they call I Corps, the northern part of Vietnam, but I was in the southern part of the northern part of Vietnam, so at a place called Duc Phu. I flew uh, with the 174th Aviation Company, and that's uh, how, through the long way, I got to meet Jackie and Steve last night. It was a guy by the name of Fred Thompson that was in our unit, and he came in country probably when I had a year in. And I thought I was really hot stuff, and I really liked the Army, and I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. So what I did was uh, I volunteered for the Army to make me a real life officer instead of a warrant officer. And, uh, but at that time, the, Nixon got elected, and the war was winding down. And uh, so they decided they didn't need only but the best. And I only had a high school education, so they, in those days there was a commercial on TV about Charlie Tuna. So my favorite joke is, sorry, Charlie, only the get best get to be star kissed. And so they didn't give me star kissed rating. Then I, from that point, um, I decided, well, uh, they're going to give us early out if you want to put your life on the line for another uh, 180 days. So I decided to do that. And uh, I was successful and returned home after 30 months of active duty. And out of that 30 months, 18 months of it was in combat. So all I ever knew was training and combat. So then I got into uh, college, I needed money. <laughs> and the Army was there, they gave me the GI Bill, and then they said, you can serve in the United States Army Reserve, and we will pay you once every three months. And that's exactly how I needed a semester's worth of, uh, of uh, money to pay my tuition and books. So I went to a private religious school in Idaho called Riggs College. I graduated from there with honors and went to BYU after that and uh, graduated from BYU. And I went to work for the Utah Highway Patrol. We didn't have helicopters then in the Highway Patrol, so I worked on the ground. And also, um, after I worked for the Utah Highway Patrol, I worked for Driver's License Services. Four years for the Highway Patrol, three years without Driver's License Services. Ended up with a little bit of a personal challenge in my life, so I came back to California and went to prison for 25 years, okay? And uh, served as a correctional officer and a correctional counselor. Then they finally paroled me after 25 years and says, yeah, see you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> then uh, uh, that was about 2009. And uh, so, altogether, I had to think about 32 years in law enforcement. 
And uh, after that, I had another challenge in my life just recently, and so I got called on a mission for my church, and so I've been serving on a mission, and uh, then I got a call. Uh, actually, uh, there was a, a website, my unit developed a website, and Fred Thompson, who grew up in Fernando, uh, San Fernando Valley, is that what you guys call it? Yeah, over there. And he, um, he wanted to be a gunship pilot really bad, and, but he started off in slicks, which is what I, I flew, and uh, we became friends. And uh, 10 years after I got back from Vietnam, about 12 years, he got hurt. He went to work for LAPD. He got hurt arresting a guy, and uh, he was put on leave. And, uh, and the leave that he was put on, he, did, he got bored. You become kind of an adrenaline freak after you've been in combat, and uh, law enforcement kind of satisfies that need. So he, uh, he got in a wrestling match, he got thrown to the curb, ended up with a broken hip, and uh, so they put him in the detective bureau, and he had access to a lot of tools. He started, he went back in his um, orders, and he found guys the social security's numbers. I probably shouldn't say this, but anyway, he found, <laughs> he found us, okay? Got a phone call one day, and he said, um, hey, Beetle. That's what they called me because my last name's Bailey. All right, picked that up in flight school. And um, so he says, uh, where are you? I said, well, I'm up here in Sacramento. And he goes, oh, cool. He says, well, I work for LAPD. I said, well, that's good. And it just so happened that uh, my wife and I were going to go to Hawaii. And uh, we had to go out of L.A. to get the flight. And he says, well, uh, why don't you come down, down here and, and the, let's uh, get back together. And just the kind of cop he was. <laughs> He's funny. He says, well, I'll meet you at this restaurant. He sat out in the parking lot, asked me the description of my car, and watched us come in the parking lot. He wanted to make sure I wasn't a homeless veteran, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, we, we headed off, and he hosted us a couple of times at his house over in uh, Tahunga Canyon. And uh, so anyway, that's uh, how. Uh, then he ended up uh, passing away at uh, 52 years of age from something from Vietnam, but they didn't know what it was. Could have been Agent Orange or anything, but uh, he was a smoker, so it could have been that too. So he he passed away, and uh, that was a sad time for a lot of people. But before he did, he wrote his uh, personal history, and what he did also was he uh, helped to establish the 174th Aviation Company Association. So all these guys all get together once a year back at Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and I've only been able to make it to one reunion because of personal issues and stuff like that, but it's neat to go back and see these guys you flew with and see how we've all gotten fat and uh, gray hair, mustaches, uh, can't walk hardly at all, but anyway, just the age. <clears throat> so today I wanted to talk a little bit about two forbidden subjects. Um, one is politics and one is religion, and the reason I wanted to bring that up was because um, I was going to the advanced course at uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama back in uh, probably d uh, 10 to 11 years after I had been in Vietnam, so it had been about 1980. And the instructor was talking and he said, what is the purpose of the military? And you know, we come up with all these ideas and stuff like that, and he goes, no, the purpose of the military is to impose our political will. I want you to think about that, because what is our political will? In my mind, it's freedom, okay? Now, there's a possibility that when I talk about some of these subjects, sometimes I get a little bit uh, emotional. Uh, I'll try to maintain my composure, all right? Um, and because that hit me, it, it just kind of just struck me as like, that's our job. And uh, this may sound a little bit morbid or cruel, but one time I'm talking to this young major and we were back in a training division and we were doing this exercise and uh, a couple of aircraft in the scenario got shot down and he goes, yeah, we, we, we crushed those guys, blah, blah, blah. And I says, yeah, we lost two, two aircraft too. I says, that's somebody's son, somebody's father, somebody's dad, grand, grand, granddad, cousin, nephew. All of those things. And I says, do you know what our purpose is? And he goes, well, no, I, I haven't really thought about it. And uh, so this is where the morbid part comes. I said, our job is to go anywhere in the world and to kill people better than they can kill us. 
he looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting that he didn't ha happen to think about what our job was. And uh, doing this and stay alive and impose political will of a free nation to be allow people freedom to do what they want within law and the rule of law. So um, I said today is not about me, it's about the others like me, and that was all these guys that stood up. But what about the guys that are not here that, that aren't able to stand right now? Those to me, I've heard it before and I, I believe it, and that's, they're the real heroes. They're the ones who um, made the supreme sacrifice, as the Savior said, greater love hath no man than to give his life for another. And I understand that principle. If you ever look at the awards that are given in the military for heroism, therefore you stick in your, your life on the line to save and to rescue your fellow man. I can tell you from personal experience, there's a fine line between a hero and a crazy guy. And I look back at the awards that I received, and I think, boy, you were stupid. But at the time, it didn't seem stupid. I did it because I knew that that guy that I was going in to try and rescue would do it for me. And uh, I think about that often. I think uh, some things I'd like to share with you is uh, I studied a little bit uh, after Jackie and I got together on the internet and started talking and stuff uh, via emails. I really put a lot of thought and prayer into what to say today. And I think these are some kind of things that we need to understand about our guys that go out and uh, and the women. I'm not just talking about men, okay? I'm talking about women, too. And uh, what it's like to associate with them after they've been through trauma, okay? We need to understand they have a dark sense of humor. Uh, learning a new sense of humor is something that you will have to get used to because they learn to cope with things with a dark sense of humor. Boy, I can testify to that one. The things they carry when you're associating with a non-military person, they might sometimes leave a shirt or socks behind after a late night visit. But if you're associating with a military person or a veteran, you may have to deal, deal with a forgotten utility knife or something else you might not expect. It can be anything, I'll tell you that. Opening up takes a little longer. Any relationship is built upon trust and understanding. A relationship with a vet is no different. Special importance has to be put on trust, though, when someone's ready to open up, you have to be ready to listen and try and understand things you may have never experienced and couldn't begin to comprehend. Many veterans are used to losing the people who are closest to them, whether from failed relationships in combat or to suicide. They may not want to get attached for the fear of losing you, but you have to work to build their trust. And I, man, I believe that one. And that um, it's hard to get close to them because when you get close to them, they become your friends. And when you lose them, you lose a friend. Um, also, the, uh, they comprehend the things that they've seen. I think people would ask me when I come home, oh, you were in Vietnam, what was it like? And I thought, well, what kind of question is that? What do you want me to tell you? You want me to tell you a gory war story? You want me to tell you that uh, 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 I didn't feel like going, or what, what is it? And I figured it out one day, I think. They want me to tell them what it's like to hear, to smell, to uh, feel what I feel in combat by telling them a story. You can't do it. It's an experience that you just can't do. So those are some things to think about. Inner service rivalry is all in good fun, and you already saw that this morning. Okay. Um, learn to love, to listen to stories. And there are people that like to listen to war stories. Veterans don't like to open up about them. I find that uh, I don't really try to tell the ones that are bad memories, I try to tell the ones that were fun. There's fun in the military. Believe me, there's fun. Uh, and it helps to, to lighten up the seriousness of it all. Learn to give 
you're all and try new things. So your veteran, he may uh, or she may have some quirky ideas, but excuse me, you may want to uh, try some of those things out. And uh, as long as they're moral and they're not uh, against the law, how's <laughs> that? Okay. Learn to give your all and try new things. Not every vet has post-traumatic stress, but some do. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe some of them don't, but I'm be willing to bet you that more of them have it than not. And uh, that's that funny sense of humor and stuff. Commitment is more than a ten-letter word. They will do what they say they're going to do. And they'll be where they say they're going to be and they'll be there when they're supposed to be there on time with all the effort that they can possibly make because they know that you're dependent upon them and you're de and, and they are dependent upon you and it's teamwork to the most finite precise way of executing it okay that's enough about how to deal with veterans statistics about the Vietnam War Viet and I don't like to call it a war because it was never declared a war. And if you really stop and think about it, our country has never declared war, as far as I know, since World War II. We've been all involved in conflicts, which is against the Constitution to fight like that. We're supposed to fight against nation states. When I raised my hand as a young officer candidate, well, actually, when I was going in as Private Joe Snuffy, it was to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Came home and did it again as a law enforcement officer. Okay? And I believe in it. The Constitution is an inspired document. This country is the promised land. This nation is the greatest nation on earth because we believe in God. And once we learned not to believe in Him, we're in trouble. We're in real trouble. Okay? Statistics about the Vietnam War. There are a few myths about those who served and who died during the Vietnam conflict. Maybe this information will help to clear some of them up. The following are some statistics that are in one sense a bit concerning yet in a larger sense should give all of us a huge sense of satisfaction. I remember when I got in the Army, I started hearing statistics. And I thought, wow, why could they keep telling us this and that? And then, you know, your chances of this, your chances of that. And uh, after I got over there, a lot of them came true and I go, whoa. Uh, these statistics were taken from a variety of sources to include the VFW magazine, the public information office, and the headquarters of the CP Forward Observer, the first recon on April 12, 1997. During the five decades after Vietnam, the clock of Father Time has been ticking. If you don't believe that, look at me, look at those that are wearing the Vietnam veterans hat. We're not young 20 year olds or 19 year olds anymore, okay? Um, of the 2,709,918 Americans who served in Vietnam, that's in country, boots on the ground, you were there in the borders, okay? Less than 850,000 are estimated to still be alive today. So 2 million, only 850,000, as this is of 1997. So you're watching us go out the door, okay? Um, and uh, the the youngest estimated uh, veteran of Vietnam alive today is approximately 60 years old. Uh, so if you're alive and reading this, how does it feel to be among the last one-third of all the U.S. vets who served in Vietnam? I don't know about you guys, but it kind of gives me the willies, considering this is the kind of information I'm used to reading about World War II veterans, Korean veterans, and that, those guys. If you look at some of them, I go to the grocery store quite often in my church calling to get things from missionaries. And I see guys with veterans hats and I walk up to them and say, when were you there? What did you do? Some guys are 95 years old and still up, World War II veterans. And I just love to listen to where they served and to see them still alive. Statistics for individuals in uniform in country Vietnam veterans. 9,087,000 military personnel served during the they got war here, I like to say conflict, okay? Between August 5th, 1964 to May 7th, 1975. We were there, okay, in the late 50s. Okay? There were advisors there. That's why the, the, that little green ribbon that you see about Vietnam says 1960 on it. That's when the government, quote, officially 
recognized that we were involved in Vietnam, all right? Um, <clears throat> 8,744,000 GIs were on active duty during the 1964 to 1973 time frame. Um, I told you about that 2,709,000, 9.7% of their generation. That's what they represent. I don't know how many of you realize this. During World War II, there were 133 million people in the United States at that time. 13 million were in the uniform. That means every tenth person was in related or involved in the military in one way or another. Vietnam, almost the same thing. All right. <clears throat> uh, maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something to get on with it. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Talks about 7,484 women served. 6,250 of them, or 83 and a half percent, were nurses who served in Vietnam. Got to tell you a story about that. We called them donut dollies, all right? I, I don't know why we called them that, but that's what they, they were. And uh, they wore these little uniforms and stuff. And we would take them to fire support bases uh, and drop them off, and they'd be there for a day. And they'd play cards with the guys, and they would talk to them and, you know, kind of boost them around. One day, we got this mission to go take these donut dollies from the brigade headquarters out to a battalion fire base uh, on this little hill. It was LZ Debbie. And uh, we dropped them off. Five hours later, go pick them up. We go pick them up. And, hey, can you guys stop at this field location and uh, give them a battery for their PRC-25? That's a radio. And uh, and because uh, their their radios are gone bad, their, their batteries are low. Yeah, we'll do that. Ooh, I didn't know we weren't supposed to take females into the combat zone. We got down and we landed. I just put the collective pitch down. And the next thing I hear is, da, 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 da. we were taking fire. So the guy that, when I was, that was training me, he was a little bit quicker on the draw at that time than I was. He grabbed that, those controls and off we took. And when we got out of there, we got back to brigade headquarters. We found out we weren't supposed to go into a field location with the women on board. They got out and they came over and I remember looking out the window and this young lady looking up at me said, they can be careful. I says, yeah, okay, well, I'll try to do that. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, peak troop strength in Vietnam, 543,482 in 1968, which was right after the Tet Offensive. And uh, a lot of guys were there during Tet. I missed it, and I'm not sorry that I missed it. Agent Orange is taking a huge toll on the Vietnam vets. Okay, casualties, talks about the first one that died in 1958. was a radio guy. Talks about the missing guys. Hostile deaths, 47,378. Non-hostile, 10,800. Um, nurses died, eight. One was killed in action. 61% of the men killed were 21 years or younger. If you know anything about World War II, the highest rate of uh, death casualties was in the uh, Air Force or the Army Air Corps. Because when you lost a B-17 bomber or B-24, you lost 10 men just like that. So. They were also in that age group. The, 20, the, the uh, English people would always talk about how young they were. 11,465 uh, of those killed were younger than 20 years old. Of those killed, 17,539 were married. Average age of men killed was 23.1 years of age. Total deaths uh, were listed, 50,274, and they were average age of 22.3 years. Officers, 6,598. 28.43 years in age. Warrant officers, those were the mostly pilots, 1,262. So really, was it that dangerous to be a pilot? I learned very quickly that you can get shot down, you can crash, you can land hard, you can do a lot of things in a helicopter, and you can walk away from it. And when you do, that's a good landing, okay? So, um, severely disabled, 75,000. 23,214 uh, 23, are 100% disabled, 5,293 lost limbs, 1,081 sustained multiple amputations. And I can testify that I rescued a guy, lost both legs, just below the uh, knee, maybe one of them above the knee, and one or two arms. And when I looked him in the eye at the hospital and told him that I was the guy that rescued him the day before, he looked me in the eye and he said, thanks, ma'am. You know, didn't get any hero medal for it or anything. 
that that was worth it. And uh, he was from Ohio. Um, talks about POWs missing in action. That's why we have the flag. And so because in their honor, 70, 776 of them were di died in captivity. 2,338 of them were missing in action. And as of January 15th, 2014, there are still 1,875 Americans unaccounted for from the Vietnam War. Talks about the draftees, but he just goes on and on. Talks about the race and ethnic background, and I don't want to keep on boring you. Uh, I hope it's not boring to you. I just want you to know, we, we just don't kind of get in and, and read about the things. I urge you to read uh, and find out for yourself. 74% say they would serve again, even knowing the outcome. 87% of the public now holds Vietnam veterans in high esteem. I can tell you when you came home, they didn't. I can swear to that one. 91% of actual Vietnam veterans and 90% of those who saw heavy combat are proud to have served their country. And I believe that. Okay, so that's enough about statistics in Vietnam. And then I just wanted to close with this, uh, this last little thing because of the things that are going on today out there in... Uh, the world. The world is when we were in Vietnam was back in the states with the land of the big PX. So, but um, this deals with the 13 folds of the American flag. Um, there's a, a couple of disclaimers that are given by the people that uh, wrote this. This uh, these about the folds. It's not an official government position. It's not um, accepted in in, uh, in the sense of officialdom. However, the VFW and others uh, use this at ceremonies when they're um, honoring the fallen. The American flag, it's a symbol of our freedom. You might have thought it was to symbolize the original 13 colonies. Here's one story that is dear to many veterans and their families. The first fold of our flag is a symbol of life. The second fold is a symbol of our belief in eternal life as religion. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veterans departing our ranks who gave a portion of their lives for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold represents our weaker nature for as American citizens trusting in God, it is to him we turn in times of peace as well as in times of war for his divine guidance. And I thank the chaplain for his beautiful prayer this morning. The fifth fold is a tribute to our country for in the words of Stephen Decatur, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right. But it is still our country, right or wrong. And that sounds like my dad. The sixth fold is, is for where our hearts lie. It is with our heart that we pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. That's why we put our hands over our heart. And to the republic, not democracy, the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces, for it is through the armed forces that we protect our country and our flag against all of her enemies, whether they are found within or without the borders of our republic. The eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood and mothers. For it has been through their faith, their love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great has been molded. It's the mothers. They're the nurturers. They're the teachers, the dads. Uh, some people will want to argue about that being politically correct or not, but it's what I believe. The tenth fold is a tribute to the father, for he too has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country since they were first born. The eleventh fold represents the lower portion of the seal of the King of David and King Solomon and glorifies in the Hebrews' eyes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Religion back in it. The twelfth fold represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies the Christian's eyes, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The thirteenth fold, or when the flag is completely folded, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of the nation's motto, In God We Trust. After the flag is completely folded and tucked in, it takes on the appearance of a cocked hat, ever reminding us of the soldiers who served under General George Washington 
and the sailors and the marines, whose birthday was yesterday, by the way, uh, who served under Captain John Paul Jones, who were followed by their friends and shipmates in the armed forces of the United States, preserving for us the rights, privileges, and freedoms we enjoy. So the next time you see the flag ceremony honoring someone that has served our country, either in the armed forces or in the civilian services such as police departments or fire departments, please keep in mind all the important reasons behind each and every moment they have paid the ultimate sacrifice for all of us, which was very apparent at 9-11. Uh, and uh, I leave those thoughts with you in the name of our Lord and Savior, even Jesus Christ. And I say to you, God bless America. And thank you for this opportunity to speak to you today. I hope I didn't bore you. I hope it was interesting. And uh, thanks for having this ceremony. By the way, this is the day my dad passed away on in 1994. Thank you. Thank you, Major. We are so honored that he drove almost 400 miles to come here just to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Now we, we have um, Scott Short, boat's Wayne mate with the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, doing our missing man ceremony. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. All right, I'd like to uh, call your attention to the small table to my left, to uh, which this occupies a place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our uniformed services are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as prisoners of war, POWs, and missing in action, MIAs. We call them comrades. They are, they are unable to be with their loved ones and families, so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and bear witness to their continued absence. This table is set for one. It is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his or her oppress suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. There's a single red rose in the vase. This signifies the blood of many who have shed their sacrifice to ensure freedom of our beloved United States of America. The rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep the faith while awaiting their return. The yellow ribbon on the vase represents the yellow ribbons worn on the lapels of thousands who de demand with unyielding determination a proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us today. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless fallen tears of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us today. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from their captors to the open arms of a grateful nation. Let us pray to the Supreme Commander that all our comrades will soon be back in our ranks. Let us remember and never forget their sacrifices. May God forever watch over them and protect them and their families. Thank you. Okay, now comes the time where I will be reading the names of our um, active service men and women and our veterans that we have flags for up here. If you would like to add a flag for next year, there's a table over on the other side of the pavilion, or you can see any of the park people. So, on uh, thank you to these brave men and women who are either veterans or active servicemen and women. Salvador Haraki, U.S. Marine Corps Captain, 
Brett Eastman, U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant, Jonathan Wilson, U.S. Army Specialist, Justin Watson, U.S. Air Force Captain, Christopher Stagg, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant, Eric William Darling, U.S. Army Sergeant, Brent Woodard, U.S. Army Specialist, 4th Class, Adam Woodard, U.S. Navy Petty Officer, 2nd Class, Joshua Jones, U.S. Air Force, Private, 2nd Class, Brian Packeiser, U.S. Army Specialist, Philip Packeiser, U.S. Army Warrant Officer, Becca Smith, U.S. Coast Guard, Lieutenant, Junior Grade, Sandy Stanbro, U.S. Navy, Senior Chief, Robert Betts, U.S. Marine Corps, Private First Class. Kevin Duxbury, U.S. Army Staff Sergeant. Jerry Peterson, U.S. Army Sergeant E-5 Special Forces. Mari Passantino, U.S. Air Force Captain. Michael Talbot, U.S. Army Captain. George Pruitt, U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Todd Harris, U.S. Navy Petty Officer Second Class. Matthew Depking, U.S. Coast Guard Lieutenant. Arpine Sarkeesian, U.S. Army Major. James Freeman, U.S. Army Specialist Fourth Class. Heidi Murata, U.S. Army Masters. Oh, sorry, there's two pages here I'm putting together. Heidi Murata, U.S. Army. Jeffrey Archer, U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant. Michael Foster, Jr., U.S. Navy Fire Technician Seaman. Brandon Litchfield, U.S. Army Specialist. Steve Stanbro, U.S. Navy. Josh, Josh Smith, U.S. Coast Guard Lieutenant. Kent Madsen, U.S. Army Private First Class. Nolan R. Cochran, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant. Nicole Gerfellers, U.S. Coast Guard, Lieutenant Junior Grade. Scott A. Bailey, U.S. Army Major. Jacob Eston, U.S. Marine Corps, Private First Class. Philip Zwart, U.S. Army Specialist. Joseph Duran, U.S. Air Force, Airman First Class. Ben Perez, U.S. Army Chief Warrant Officer. Brady Hull, U.S. Army Private First Class. Steve Smith, U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant. Craig Bays, U.S. Army Specialist. William D. Litchfield, U.S. Air Force Major. Marcia Litchfield, U.S. Air Force Captain. Scott V. Litchfield, U.S. Air Force Airman First Class. Frank Clark, U.S. Navy Petty Officer First Class. Ray B. Collins, U.S. Air Force Tech Sergeant. James Golden Clark, U.S. Navy Ships Cook Second Class. Johnny Cobra, U.S. Army E-5. Larry Hopman, U.S. Army Sergeant. Peter R. Marshall, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant. Myron L. Walter, U.S. Army Specialist Fourth, fourth Class. Brian Robert Edgel, U.S. Army Private First Class. William H. Sutton, U.S. Army Specialist Five. Steve Harbison, U.S. Air Force Sergeant. Richard T. Hubbard, U.S. Army Specialist Fourth Class. Salvador Olivas, U.S. Army. Heather Savage, I don't have information here for her. Teodoro Trujillo, U.S. Army Sergeant. Wesley Johnson, U.S. Navy E-6. Phoenix Villanue Villanueva, U.S. Air Force. Russ Fox, U.S. Navy Petty Officer, Second Class. Richard Shep, U.S. Army Sergeant. William G. Anderson, U.S. Navy Seabees. Eduardo Rincon, Jr., U.S. Navy Private Second Class. Thor Merritt, U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant. Peter Alfieri, U.S. Navy Seaman. Charles V. Bruce, U.S. Air Force Sergeant. Sean Empey, U.S. Army Private Military Police. Kim Bennett, U.S. Army Sergeant E-5. Henry Reynolds, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant. Craig Bays, U.S. Army Sergeant. Manny P. Cortez, Jr., U.S. Army Sergeant First Class E-7. Dan Donald Alexander Belinsky, U.S. Navy Petty Officer Third Class.
David J. Serge, U.S. Air Force, Senior Master Sergeant. Timothy A. Hackman, Marines, Sergeant. That should be U.S. Marine Corps, sorry. Patrick Bauman, U.S. Marine Corps Staff Sergeant. Lauren W. James, U.S. Marine Corps Gunnery Sergeant. Christopher G. James, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant. Glenn Necessary, U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Military Intelligence. James B. Wade, U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant. Roger Stell, U.S. Marine Corps Private First Class. Scott Short, Coast Guard, Boat Swain Mate. Andrew Hardin, U.S. Army Sergeant. Carl Eads, U.S. Air Force Master Sergeant. Thomas A. Tapia, U.S. Marine Corps Captain. Gordon F. Burroughs, U.S. Navy. Keith Pulsifer, U.S. Navy Radio Men Second Class. Jennifer Olson, U.S. Air Force Staff Sergeant. And John McLean, U.S. Air Force Airman Second Class. Thank you all. Let's give them a big hand. Now our, our Cub Scouts and Girl Scouts will be singing God Bless America. boys and girls. That concludes our ceremony today. Thank you again to all of our active service men and women and our veterans and for all of you who came out today. Thank you. Sarah, tell me, uh, what do you have here? I have my father who served in Vietnam. His books from the Vietnam War, his Purple Heart, and just Look at that yeah, gorgeous Purple Heart. Amazing? He's generous, generous enough to have, give his time to me to tell me about Vietnam because I've never looked through this. Really? Now my dad has passed. 
Yeah, she just took him out of the attic today. Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> See how God works? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I had mysterious no, ways. I had no, mm -hmm. I brought them actually to sit with my girls because I homeschooled them and I had no intention of asking about them until I got here. And I'm like, wait a minute. So this right here. Is that your grandpa? Yeah. So, Let's see. Ask me a question. Yeah. Okay, turn around so I can see it. That is your grandpa. No, what a no, handsome no, guy. Is this that? 69. Yeah, that's 69. So this picture here, this is what the witch makes with the shoes. Those are jungle oh, boots. Okay. Jungle boots. Yeah. And then right here, he looks like to me he's sitting on the front of his porch of his hooch. Okay. That was kind of, you know, take a picture of me sending back to the world. Oh, right. So these, it's like a, their like, market? Yeah, it like looks like open a, market? Yeah. Like down in the in the local village is what I would say. I like seeing these because my brother is a detective in Las Vegas. Oh, hey, the detective! And I like seeing just the stands because it's my brother, and I like to I kind of have a piece. You know, I have a piece of my father. Come on, there's two of these. But see how neat this is. Yes. That's MPC that was, they use that. Uh, that's what we use to go to the PX, go to the commissary, go to the, you know, just to buy things on post. There are some bloody pictures in this one. The bloody up shop put. <gasps> this blanket, oh my gosh. He used this every day until the day he passed away. It was his nap blanket. It's a poncho liner. Yeah, it, it, it's a what? A poncho liner. It's not even a blanket? No. Oh my gosh! It, it, uh, when you have the poncho, it's for rain protection. Oh and that was the liner to keep you warm. And it was made out of like a nylon. It's really, really durable. You would always call me, well, I'm going to my horizontal hibernation. <laughs> and it was always with that blanket. That's so great. I'll call his shoes. and stuff underneath his bunk. Yeah. That's where you have to <laughs> you Okay, here's the bloody. Yeah, so, he's, so say he's in like... Um, yeah, he's in scrubs. Yeah. Yeah, hospital scrubs. It is nasty. Yeah. That, that's great pictures, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> that looks pretty bad. Well, that's pretty mild, my dear. <laughs> oh, oh what are these medals are? That's, national that's, Defense. Okay, that's a National Defense ribbon. And uh, Republic all of the, Vietnam Service. Yeah, everybody got one of those. And then oh, okay. Vietnam Service when you're in country. So these mean your rank, right? Nope. Oh, no? Those are these. Oh. Okay. Oh, they're the Oh, they kind of match. They do match. Oh, this is what match. you wear on okay. your uniform, and this is the what you receive when you get the original award. Oh. And you get your okay. So go get your purple heart thing, sweetie, right over there. Okay. So when you get your award, all right, you're standing in formation, and the officer comes up and he pins this on you, on your jungle fatigues or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he salutes you, all right, and then he goes on to the next person, all right. So these were automatic. Oh, in other okay. words, when you went in country, this is what you got, and then, so, and then, this is, I think, believe, this is, is this the campaign or the service? It says, it says, United States, um, Vietnam service this is Vietnam, the, yeah. the green one, there's a green one that's not here, it's oh, okay. the Vietnam service ribbon, and this is a campaign ribbon, and for, for every six months, there was a new campaign, so you would get this, and then you would get a little, what they call like a, a star or something on it, so oh. like my air medals, they say, oh, he has an air medal, I actually have 40 air medals. Wow. Okay. So it's for yeah, every, one for every 25 time. hours of combat time. Wow. Combat so the Purple Heart, do you receive this in combat, like in Vietnam, or when you get back to the state? They do it right there in the hospital sometimes. Oh. Have you ever seen the movie Pat? You know, my father has two of them, actually. I don't yeah. know where the other one is. So right? in the movie Pat, that's what he did. He, he went and, and put the, the ribbons, the, the, the uh, metal on the pillow of the soldiers that were wounded because he respected them so much. So this is okay, and this one here maybe AIT. So he's got a grenade. Is that a grenade? Mm -hmm. Looks like a grenade. And yeah, then, a grenade. Yeah, and then a rifle. So and this is an M16. Is that like Steel a pot. huge rattlesnake rattle? It, looks, it like looks like it. I'm the only one that got my dad's blue eyes, and all my daughters. They're all almost my, green. Yeah, but all my my everyone in my family in the only. <laughs> so my brother looks just like him, and I was lucky enough to get that. I really appreciate this meeting. Oh my gosh. Is this so? Just... What is that? We'll have to look on the back. I am so happy my dad wrote on these. Okay. I mean, what a gift. It's 
it's really interesting how precious this is because it's well, obvious. they got something. Look, looks like they got some. Ew. <laughs> Come on, see. It's like a, a plaque or an award for something. Is that him? No, that's not him. It looks like it. That's a doctor. Oh. See the, the signet here? That's a doctor and it looks like a lieutenant colonel. Oh. Yeah, so Which one? That little one up on the... This is the doctor. And it, what it is, is you ever see a picture of the snake around? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a medical course. Oh, yeah, okay. the snake around the oh, little yeah, thing on the that. ambulance. Oh, okay. Okay, and I can't remember the name of the term, but anyway, this is a uh, black oak leaf, so that's a, mate, a lieutenant colonel. So he probably was one of the physicians there on post. It's neat to see just this because we recently went on the tour of the Midway in San Diego, uh -huh. and just to see how. It, oh yeah, that's where you got that. How they lived on the ship, and now this is how they're really living in combat. So combat. So this looks like yeah. a restaurant or something with it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. The petition meeting. See, I think he was. That looks like X-ray. Yeah. Table. yeah.